Hi all, this is, this is Valerie. Good morning, Valerie. How are you? Sorry, I was, I was struggling to get in. <laughs> I just want to let you know I'm in now. Fantastic. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think we should be good to go. Just checking, Roldo, you're going to be admitting people as they come in, um, I'm presuming. And I'll just mute everyone. Is that cool, Roldo? Thumbs up. Yeah, that I'll do that, Kate. Okay, fantastic. Okay. All right. Um, cool, I think I'm going to try and ignore this waiting room thing here. Um, I'm hoping everyone can see me. Um, and hear me, we've got around 40 participants in the meeting thus far. I can still see that people are, um, are joining rapidly, um, but I think it would be good, we've got quite a tight agenda just to um, kick off with the, with the session. Um, and um, yeah, just to, to head off. So yeah, we're here to have a webinar dialogue about innovative brine management solutions. Um, and uh, this is the, the webinar. My name is Claire Pengeli. Um, and really, um, just a very quick introduction to those of you who perhaps are not uh, familiar with, with Green Cape. Green Cape is a nonprofit organization. We work with business, government, and academia, removing the barriers to catalyze the large scale uptake and spread of economically viable green economy solutions um, and innovations. Um, and really our vision is around um, uh, having a, a thriving, prosperous Africa mobilized by the, by the green economy. Um, so we have a number of different sectors that we, uh, that we, that we work within. So um, today we've actually got a really interesting uh, mix of a variety of different sectors that we're gonna be looking at with regards to brine. So this is effectively hosted by the water program, um, but we are obviously gonna be um, introducing some guys from the waste as well as from the energy teams, which is quite exciting. Um, but above and beyond the work that we do in waste and energy, we have a very strong uh, circular economy focus. We do quite a lot of work on uh, finance as well. Um, and uh, we also have a strong agriculture uh, program as well. Okay, so really the purpose of today's webinar is to talk about brine. So brine wastewater management is a significant challenge for, for many companies. And we've seen this in a number of uh, different areas and spheres of our work. Um, and we really want to use this event as an opportunity to discuss some of the viable options that are out there, um, but also acknowledging that this is a significant challenge and really it is um, a call to action to find innovative cost effective solutions um, because there's not a lot of options out there. Um, and then also just to note as well that um, this event and the, the work that went into, into it has been funded by the city of Cape Town. So thank you very much to the city. Um, they really have supported us in trying to address this particular issue. Um, as um, we have noted that during the course of the drought, uh, there were a number of companies that have been, uh, um, uh, been uh, struggling with this particular concern. Okay, so heading on. Uh, in terms of the agenda, um, so we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at the background of, of the challenge. Uh, for, so for those of you who perhaps are not aware of it, but really just spending a little bit of time as to why this is such a significant challenge and why it's going to become more of a challenge into the future. Uh, we'll look at some of the options that we've explored uh, within Green Cape um, and we'll really kind of talk a little bit about the, the possibilities for them as well as some of the constraints uh, to, to the management of them. We'll then have a couple of presentations, so one from um, Interwaste and De Beer, just in terms of looking at some of the opportunities that they've explored um, and, um, and really kind of outlined a few kind of case studies. We'll then move over to an interactive session. Um, so, you know, we're going to have a Q&A at that point on the presentations. And we are very excited to also have Dr. Valerie Naidu and Dr. Henry Roman uh, joining us for that panel discussion, as well as with the presenters from Interwaste and De Beer and Associates. 
Um, at that point, we'll close up just uh, towards, the, towards 12 um, and really um, outline the way forward. So very briefly, just mentioning who is attending this webinar. Um, we have, um, we got about 70 RSVPs, but I think Jane gave me an update this morning that we're closer to 100 RSVPs, which I think is, which is, I think is fascinating. Um, and we've got quite an interesting mix of different organizations that have, that have joined the, the, um, the event. So the reason that we're pulling this up is to say that, you know, normally Green Cape um, hosts networking events. This is kind of our core part of our, um, our role and mandate within the organization and the, and the ecosystem. Um, and, but because we're working virtually now under a new scenario, and this is our official kind of first uh, webinar within the water environment to, to, to have an event of this nature, we don't want to completely lose the opportunity to allow for networking and, and collaboration amongst various different organizations. Um, so just noting that these are the, the mix of organizations that, that have joined the, the webinar, and we'd really like to see if there are opportunities for collaboration uh, further down the line. I think also just very briefly, there is gonna be quite a lot of discussion relating to regulations and you know, what's happening around the landfill ban, et cetera, um, and that we're very happy to have some government representatives here who can perhaps help us tackle some of the, the key questions questions uh, that, 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 come, that arise due to this, this particular challenge. So we do have DEF here, we have DEP from the Western Cape Government, as well as the City of Cape Town. So thank you very much for joining. So in terms of the, the rules for the particular webinar, um, please just note that it would be fantastic, as I said, to um, add your organizational name into, um, into your name that's actually on the, on the webinar participants list. So this will help us um, and everyone else identify um, that where you're from and to be able to kind of maybe have a, a conversation thereafter to say you perhaps want to be connected with them. Um, so please to do this, what you need to do is on your, on your screen, click on the participants, um, then click on your name. You'll notice that there's a little button that says more there. Um, and click on rename and then simply add your organization name in brackets. Uh, you should see that that's the way that I've done my particular um, name right now. Um, so, you know, obviously to keep things running smoothly, we're going to keep, please keep your camera and mic off. Um, unless, of course, you're a speaker or a panelist and speaking at that particular point. And then we're going to use the chat function to ask questions. So there are going to be a few presentations, as noted, and we will have some uh, a session at the, at the latter part of the webinar where it might, will be much more interactive. So I will be gathering those questions through the chat function and, and directing them to the appropriate uh, participants in the webinar. So please add those in, add them as you're thinking of them, et cetera, and I'll collate them um, and, and ask them to uh, be answered by the particular relevant representatives from the organizations. Um, and then I guess just to, to say that we have also gathered a few other questions that were gathered through the RSVP process. Um, and those also will be addressed as we go through the, um, as we go through the, the webinar. So finally, just to, to hand over to my esteemed colleagues, um, we have, we're going to first hand over to Jane, who you perhaps uh, would have seen the invite came from. She's uh, our senior water analyst within the water program. I will then be handing over to Sam, who's our waste sector desk, uh, then briefly handing back to Jane, um, and then finally handing over to Yasin, who is our bioenergy analyst, um, to, to run through their various presentations. Okay, so that's, that's it from, from my side. I'm now gonna hand over to Jane. Um, Jane, if you're there and can hear us and unmute yourself, please can you start um, uh, sharing your presentation? Thank you very much. Thanks, Claire. I'm just gonna share my screen quickly. Great. Um, I've just shared my screen. I hope uh, everyone can see it. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Claire said, I'm uh, Jane, and I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of the uh, challenge relating to brine um, so that we're all on the same page. And also just to highlight where specifically we're focusing on in this particular webinar. So firstly, what do, what do we mean by brine? <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so brine is essentially 
a high concentration solution of salt and water. And as a waste stream, it typically comes from reverse osmosis processes or um, other wastewater treatment processes from industry or from mining. Um, in terms of how much brine is generated, <coughs> sorry, it seems to have a frog in my throat. Um, <coughs> uh, so in terms of how much brine is generated each year in South Africa, there's, uh, there's very, seems to be a low level of confidence in the data. Um, and this is partly because um, waste streams where the majority of that waste stream goes to landfill, there's better confidence in the reporting. In the case of brine, the majority does not go to landfill. So there's a low level of confidence and it's underreported. Um, but it seems that there was a study done in uh, 2009 uh, that even the sort of most recent government reports seem to refer to that estimated that there's around uh, 1 million kiloliters per day of brine that's generated in South Africa, of which around half of that is disposed via sea outfall, so via pipeline into the sea. And this the same study um, gave a breakdown of um, of where these um, uh, where this brine is coming from. And what you can see here is that so this is sorry this is brine that's generated that's not sent to sea outfall, so it excludes sea outfalls, and um, the major um, producer is, uh, of brine is the mining industry, but other major sectors are petroleum, power generation, pulp and paper, steels, other metal processing, and then other. And of other, about a third of that is um, agro-processing. So the mining sector is the major contributor towards brine. And in fact, the same study estimated that um, over the period of from 2009 to 2029, that 20 year period, that there would be an increase in brine generation by about five to six times, and that this would almost entirely be due to mining. So clearly the mining is the mining sector is the major concern from a brine perspective, perspective um, uh, and this problem needs to be tackled. Uh, but for the purposes of this particular webinar, we're actually not focusing on the mining industry. We're focusing on a, um, a smaller subset, um, specifically on, oh, sorry, um, on brine that is generated by businesses for that either want to treat groundwater. So if the water is particularly saline, they want to treat it. And in order to get it to the quality that they need, they need to use reverse osmosis, then a brine stream will result. Um, or, for example, other industrial processes where the brine stream is produced in the industrial process itself. So um, those are where we're focusing on, specifically excluding mining, where they have a different scale to the problem and the solutions will be slightly different. Um, but yeah, that's where, so that's where we're focusing on. But that doesn't mean that there aren't um, lessons learned from the mining industry that, will, that can be applied to these, this particular context. And uh, in this discussion, I'm sure that there are lessons that we can share from the mining industry that will be relevant. So what we found is that uh, many of the companies that produce these types of uh, brine that we're focusing on in this webinar, that a number of these companies have been struggling to find well-suited, cost-effective solutions uh, to manage their brine. Uh, so for example, uh, during the recent drought in the Western Cape, there were a number of companies that um, wanted to tap into groundwater to, um, for security of supply. But in many cases, the projects weren't able to go ahead simply because there was no solution for, called cost-effective solution for the brine management. Um, and in some cases, uh, actually projects did go ahead and companies spent a few million on a, on a treatment plant only to discover that there was no solution for, for, for the brine and they're left with stranded assets. Mm -hmm. Um, so this dialogue, as Claire mentioned, we're aiming to highlight this challenge and put out a call for a need for innovative solutions. And obviously it's not expected that one solution is going to solve all these problems. Each brine solution will be, each brine stream will be different. Um, and so it will call for different solutions. But I think there's an opportunity for, for partnerships that hopefully can come out of this, um, this uh, meeting. And then also I just wanted to use this opportunity just to uh, mention that Green Cape has, uh, we have compiled an industry brief. So this is aimed at commercial and industrial companies that um, want to tap into groundwater, let's say, line and want to better understand what are their options for brine management and what are the, what are the challenges associated with each one. 
So um, every, each participant will get a copy of this uh, presentation at the end. So if you're interested, you can click the link and have a look there. Um, so now I just want to also briefly touch on some of the relevant uh, wastewater and waste regulations. Again, so we're on the same page. I'll just talk about some of the, wa uh, the wastewater regulations and then my, I'll hand over to my colleague, Sam Smout, to talk about the waste regulations. So in terms of um, discharging brine to the sewer, each municipality will have its own wastewater bylaws. And in there, they'll specify what the limits are for each different parameter for the quality of the wastewater. So for example, if we have a look here, um, this is uh, for the city of Cape Town. This is from their wastewater and industrial effluent bylaw. And in here, they specify the maximum, maximum limits for permitted discharge to sewer for weight effluent. And there are only four um, parameters shown here, but in fact, there are actually many more, but I've just, for the purposes of this presentation, just uh, shown four on the screen. And specifically to highlight uh, uh, electrical conductivity, which is a indicator of how saline a waste stream is. And um, uh, here, the limit for the city of Cape Town is 500 milli Siemens per meter. Um, and to <clears throat> put that in context, the uh, seawater is often around 5,000 millisiemens per meter. And the reason for this limit is uh, because, um, because saline water can corrode pipelines in the, in the wastewater network. It can uh, impact on the wastewater treatment process. And also the municipalities themselves, they have uh, to meet discharge limits for the, the water that they've treated from wastewater treatment plants and released into the environment. So they need to meet those standards. Um, so, yeah, so um, in other words, if, if you have a brine waste stream and um, you want to discharge it to sewer, you'd need to get a permit from the municipality and it would need to, in the case of City of Cape Town, be under that um, 500 millisiemens per meter. And even if it is under that, it's not a guarantee that uh, effluent permit would be, would be um, given. And then there are other ways in which you can discharge of your, of your brine. Um, for example, to land for, as irrigation or to water resources like um, rivers or lakes. But again, there would be authorizations that would be needed. For example, um, either a water use license or a general authorization would apply. Um, or if you're looking to um, send the brine waste stream to uh, sea by sea outfall, again, um, there would be uh, permits that would be required. Um, and this would include a coastal water discharge permit. So now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Sam, to talk about some of the waste disposal regulations. Great. Uh, thanks, Jane. Uh, you can hear me? Cool. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks, Jane. Um, so my name is Sam Smart. Uh, I am Green Cape's uh, Waste Sector Desk, and I've been asked to present on the, the sort of solid waste disposal regulations that are governing um, brine and um, waste with uh, high salt content. So I thought I would show uh, this, this table, uh, this uh, map. This is a really great um, research done by uh, Linda Godfrey and Suzanne Olufsen. Um, I've put the reference on the far right, you can see there. And essentially this uh, demonstrates the different legislation that has been developed in South Africa in general around waste. Um, as you can see there's a lot of waste legislation and um, it's been broken up into sort of four um, phases or ages of waste. Uh, the first one, um, if we go on is the age of landfill and if we go on to the next slide, Jen, um, you will see that um, we have what was initially in, in 1989 was the, uh, the start of the landfill age or the age of landfill and this was kicked off by the Environmental Conservation Act and this was essentially um, our first uh, active role in managing um, waste management in South Africa. It was the first legislation that defined, that actually gave a definition of what waste was. Um, but much of this, this act was focused on uh, the permitting control and the management of uh, disposal sites in South Africa. Um, essentially, the, this, this act focused on mitigating the impacts of landfills on the environment and obviously in so doing uh, hum, uh, humans or people. Um, and what was quite, uh, 
what was quite interesting uh, was that this essentially legislation has led to the development of what's called the minimum requirements for waste disposal of landfill. Uh, it essentially was developed by, um, it was one of the a number of series of uh, minimum requirements established by the Department of uh, Water Affairs and Forestry in, 19, in 1998. Um, the emphasis is on the water affairs, and so this was a, a proactive step in um, developing sort of minimum requirements or guidelines uh, to prevent the degradation of water quality and the environment. Um, and to also sort of have a, uh, improve the standards for waste disposal in South Africa. Uh, just to highlight that this Environmental Conservation Act has essentially been um, dismantled and when it comes to waste management, it has been taken over by the National Environmental Management uh, Waste Act, which I'll get into just now. Uh, next slide, Jane. So um, once the, uh, the Environmental Conservation Act was in place, uh, soon after we had the Constitution of South Africa, which was uh, promulgated in 1996, and essentially this solidified the right of everyone uh, to an environment that is not harmful to their health and well-being. And it essentially provides the sort of foundations of uh, future legislation, particularly when we're looking at uh, in the environment. Um, next slide, Jane. This resulted in the, the development of the National Environmental Management Act. Uh, this was essentially a, a framework act that looked at um, or that um, that was responsible for enforcing, administering, and governing environmental management legislation in the future or going forward. Um, it had a number of principles that guided uh, future uh, legislation, and uh, that included the polluter pays principle, cradle to grave, the precautionary principle, and waste avoidance and minimization. Uh, it also provided for a great uh, foundation to establish other um, specific environmental management acts that focused on um, sort of specific um, uh, elements of uh, that impact on the environment. So one of, if you go into the next slide, Jane, um, one of these uh, specific environmental management acts was the National Environmental uh, Management Waste Act, uh, more colloquially known as the Waste Act. And this, this legislation um, promulgated in 2008 essentially uh, sort of governs how waste is managed in South Africa. Um, once this legislation was enacted, uh, it resulted in a, a great many number of legisla legislative um, regulations that uh, governed waste management. Uh, and you can see um, sort of in the background, you can see where at the top where it says the flood of regulations. And this was um, specifically around waste management. Um, three, three regulations uh, that are sort of are important when we're talking about brine include um, the waste classification and management regulations, the national norms and standards for the assessment of waste to landfill disposal, and lastly, the national, uh, sorry, the uh, norms and standards for the disposal of waste to landfill. So I'm just going to touch on the, the last one. Um, next slide, James. Uh, and that being the national norms and standards for the disposal of waste to landfill. Um, essentially, this legislation um, this legislation has been put in place to uh, to some extent um, or amend the minimum requirements for waste disposal to uh, by landfill. Uh, they provide a means to uh, classify landfills into different categories, into one of four categories. And this is determined by um, um, a sort of uh, basic, um, sorry, uh, guideline, sorry. This is determined by the types of barriers and liners that these landfills have. So there's a, there's a number of minimum requirements uh, of the different categories of landfills that must have as a minimum a certain type of uh, liner or barrier. Um, and in addition to this, these norms and standards also dictate um, what types of waste these particular categories of landfills can accept. Um, and then lastly, this, the norms and standards also provide a, um, a list of uh, waste streams uh, that are prohibited from landfill in, um, in the future. Uh, so section five of the norms and standards provides uh, a list of these specific waste streams. And you can see in the graphic below that we have quite a few waste streams that have already been banned or restricted from landfill. And we've got quite a few going into the future. Um, Jane, the next slide, please. 
of particular importance, um, sorry, one more, of particular importance uh, are two bits of, um, of two waste streams. The one is the liquid waste ban, which came into effect last year, August. Um, and then the second one being brine or waste uh, with high salt content um, coming in place next year. So the reason why I brought up the liquid waste was because obviously brine is a, um, is a high liquid content. Um, and so as of last year, essentially brine uh, in liquid, in, as a liquid waste was banned from landfill. Um, however, we know that there are cases where there's a, a sort of a slight loophole where um, these liquid wastes are uh, bulked up with um, materials to sort of solidify it or make it uh, fall out of the definition of liquid waste. Um, and so just to highlight that uh, as of next year, even if you do that, um, if that waste stream then become, still has a high salt content, um, it will then be also have to be uh, banned from landfill. So, so essentially what I'm trying to get at is that uh, this legislation governs what waste streams are, are banned from landfill. And as of last year and next year, it will be brine and uh, waste streams with high salt content. Um, I guess the reason why these, these ban, this particular ban is coming in place, um, it really comes down to what is the purpose of um, sort of the landfill uh, design, design um, so the, the barriers and liners for landfills and why they are there. And that's essentially to prevent the pollutants from landfills getting into groundwater and into the surrounding soils. And uh, this is really important because um, these uh, barriers and uh, liners um, are often exposed to various different types of chemical, biological, and physical processes that take place in the landfill. And these often include, um, pre or predominantly uh, through leachate, which is essentially like a liquid uh, tea that percolates through a landfill. And you can imagine, the best way to imagine it is if you were to take a tap and you had to uh, knock it into the, the base of a landfill and you had to turn that tap on, there would be a liquid that would roll out. Um, that leachate is made up of uh, various different components such as water, acids, solvents, and uh, salts. And these impact on those liners. And so if uh, the, these, uh, this leachate potentially impacts on the long-term performance of these liners. And so from a precautionary perspective, it's uh, it's important that uh, we keep the, those liners from being damaged and preventing them from uh, leaching or, or allowing the migration of pollutants into groundwater. So this is sort of like a, one of the reasons why these particular waste streams have been banned from landfill going forward. Great, that's it, Jane. Next slide. Thanks so much, Sam. Okay, um, so in this next section, um, myself and my colleague Yasin Sali, we're just going to give you a very brief overview of some of the, the major brine management options. Um, I will talk more specifically about the discharge and treatment options, and my colleague Yasin will be talking about the industrial symbiosis opportunities that they've explored. So firstly, just to say this is not an exhaustive list, this is more um, a list of some of the more popular options um, that are, are available to companies for treatment and disposal of brine. Um, so a company has, has two options. Essentially, there's an option to directly discharge uh, the brine stream, and then there's the option to treat it for resource recovery or disposal. Um, so in terms of direct discharge, I mentioned earlier, there's an option to discharge the brine waste stream to sewer. Um, as I mentioned, an effluent permit is required, and if the waste stream exceeds the discharge limits, then it won't be permitted. Um, companies do have the option to blend their brine with other waste streams generated on site, but then again, if that overall waste stream <coughs> does not meet the limits, then it won't be possible to discharge it to sewer. Then there's an option to discharge to evaporation ponds, um, which facilitates the sort of solar, solar evaporation of the, of the brine stream to concentrate it. But in this case, um, there's a, a large land requirement. And in many cases, this is not feasible for businesses that have space constraints, particularly those that are located in urban or peri-urban areas. And again, you're left with a concentrated brine solution that then needs to be disposed of. And from next year, that won't be possible to send it to landfill. Then there's also the option to discharge to by a sea outfall 
Um, and here there will be licenses that are required, such as the coastal water discharge permit. And there's going to be a high construction cost associated with this. So looking at, as, a, as an estimate, around 10 million rand per kilometer. So this is obviously only feasible for um, sites on the coast. And also, um, if you, it would only be feasible if you're like a very large brine producer or if multiple users can use the same outfall. Um, and then in terms of the treatment side, there are various membrane solutions, but in terms of looking at multi-stage membrane filtration, one of the challenges with this is the high capital costs. So typically, it's, so for example, um, looking at 1.5 to 3 million rand per milliliters per day of brine treated per stage with up to four stages. So that's quite a high capital cost that many companies wouldn't be able to afford and their projects like the groundwater project, for example, might not go ahead on that basis. Um, uh, and again, you're left with the remaining brine that needs to be further treated or discharged. Um, and then um, in terms of uh, other options, there are also thermal technologies, whether it be freezing, like eutectic freeze crystallization or evaporative technologies. And here again, there are high capital costs. Typically, it can be in the region of 80 to 100 million rand per million liter per day of brine treated. Um, and again, for many companies, that's not going to be a viable option. Um, there's also high energy demand, depending on what your energy costs are. It can be you know, 100 to 150 rand a kiloliter. Obviously, the eutectic freeze crystallization is a lower energy than the uh, evaporative technology, so it would use less, but there still has an energy cost to it. And then if you have um, uh, salts, if you have um, individual salts that are produced, such as through eutectic freeze crystallization, then you need to find a market for those salts. And if mixed salts are left behind, um, they, they would have a low market value and disposal is often required. And then um, that again, with the ban to landfall, that would be a challenge. So that's just a very high level overview of um, some of the options uh, that are some of the popular options that are available to companies. You can see that each of them has their own challenges. Now I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, uh, Yasin who's going to talk about some of the opportunities, the industrial symbiosis opportunities that our WISC team have explored. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, yes, so uh, I'll be speaking on the Western Cape Industrial Symbiosis and um, their focus on the brine opportunity. Um, WISP or Western Cape Industrial Symbiosis or often known as WISP, um, it focuses on um, underutilized resources, um, mainly things that come out of um, waste or that's generated as waste or waste water. These are commonly viewed as wastage or underutilized resources, and we assist businesses in finding um, value add options and holding uh, relevant networks with other businesses that can add value to this underutilized resources. Um, where WISP sort of started looking at the brine um, solution management situation was due to the increase in, in brine generation, as Jane mentioned previously, um, as uh, a, an underutilized resource, um, because a lot of businesses within the city of Cape Town, Western Cape region, were looking at alternative water sourcing plans, um, particularly uh, that were implemented during the, the drought period. Um, a lot of these uh, companies had concerns around the costing as Jane has mentioned with these technologies and they've approached WISP for alternative solutions to, to the brine um, discharge issue that they may have. Um, what WISP usually does in this situation, we do an opportunity scanning exercise which we conducted to basically assist the, the, those businesses in seeing where they could add value to the brine um, through the brine as a whole um, component or by the byproducts produced in brine treatment and disposal. Um, Jane, next slide, please. Thank you. So the options that we looked at were sort of non-existent solutions or solutions that were not common, um, not referring to the technologies that Jane mentioned. Um, we looked at um, was there a context that the brine could be used as is um, or the, um, reused as it is discharged? Um, and we had a look at whether we could feed uh, the brine into existing solutions 
such as um, composting, anaerobic digestion, uh, animal feed, um, construction materials, um, as well as we look at specific sector usage where they have a requirement for um, uh, if water streams with high um, dissolved solids contents, so like your textile um, dyeing processes or um, uh, anything that requires you to increase the, the pH or the salt content of a, a particular process. So we looked at all of those sort of situations uh, to see whether there were any context of, of where these sort of um, brine compositions can be applied. Uh, and, and naturally we encountered a number of barriers uh, from that. Uh, Jane, next slide, please. Um, the barriers we encountered were, were, were quite interesting because it, it required a bit of unlocking and uh, those markets are still being uh, assessed and researched on how to unlock those markets. Um, as we see with reuse of for brine that is discharged as is, it's very composition dependent. Um, most brine, you very rarely you find brine solutions that are the same for different sites. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, in terms of feeding it into existing solutions, the high salt content within brine often has an impact on those uh, processes. So for example, with composting, it affects the, the, the composting um, efficiency, as well as anaerobic digestion, it affects the, the pH and the, the microbial levels within anaerobic digestion. And then within animal feeds, in most cases, um, the salts within those brines are not considered food grade, um, and it, it's considered a bit of a high, high uh, level of, of, of salt for, for animals, and, and farmers would not want to take that risk. When we looked at sort of the construction materials um, sector in terms of can um, brine or the salts out, that come out of brine be used within that sector, um, brick uh, manufacturers saw that um, there was a bit of an issue with discoloration of bricks, um, and they've revealed that the market of for the bricks are very really, uh, aesthetic conscious, so they prefer to have the bricks a certain color. Um, with regards to using the salt content within paving, um, uh, there was an increased um, setting time for those paving um, at various sort of ratios of salt that has been used. So construction materials have had issues in terms of implementing it as a raw material in their, their sector as well. Then looking at specific sector use, usage, was there potential for using the brine compositions within uh, specific sectors? Textiles, um, specifically, they use um, brine solutions or salts um, to sort of improve their dye processes. Um, but it was found that here again, because of uh, the composition inconsistency, it may require large investment to sort of extract specific value products that they need in terms of the, the brine content, in terms of specific um, components within that brine. Um, we are still exploring a, a number of other options in terms of, of how we could make the brine treatment options more attractive in terms of a viable solutions. So we are happy to engage with anyone that has ideas, but most of these sort of solutions that we've looked at or explored are still in sort of research and development phases and are still um, being assessed for their business case viability. Thank you, I'll hand back to Jane on that note. Uh, thank you, that's all from my side. Okay. Um, so I think I'm picking things up here. Uh, Jane, if you don't mind. Um... Oh, there we go, you stopped your screen sharing. Um, so I guess we just wanted to, we're, um, my colleagues are efficient as usual, and we're actually ahead of time on the agenda. Um, so we weren't actually planning a Q&A session here, um, but I thought we might want to just pause um, because I see that there have been some questions posted into the chat. Um, and I wanted to just quickly see the ones that were applicable to my Green Cape colleagues, if I don't mind putting them onto the spots uh, and getting some, some thoughts from them. And you guys are obviously very welcome to say if this is not 
your uh, realm of expertise and perhaps we can hold it off for some of our uh, colleagues at a later stage. Um, but I wanted to get a sense first from Yassine um, in terms of the options that you explored there. Uh, Tyrus asked us, did you look at construction processes like roads and buildings or just construction materials in, in actually looking at the, at the options for Brian? Um, yes, that's a good question. Um, in most cases, we looked at construction material initially, um, and that is because um, a lot of those roads would use the construction materials generated, um, as well as buildings and using those bricks or concrete, like, like similar concrete uh, manufacturing processes for that the paving uses. Um, in terms of, of, of the road specifically, there are quite a lot of legislation around that and that requires unlocking. Um, you will see that in terms of our colleague Kirsten Barnes' um, construction and demolition briefing um, on where she sort of investigates the potential usage for construction material reuse in the roads and, and sort of construction materials. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Yassine. Um, I want to now pose a question to Sam. Um, this one from Wesley is quite an interesting one. Can the brine be sent to landfill packed in well-sealed containers to prevent its leaching? So you obviously went through the process of explaining, you know, why these bans are being put in place, you know, in terms of the impact that that has on the, the, the liners within those landfills. Um, but if uh, we, I'm imagining it's almost like a nuclear waste in a sense where you're packing it in so well that there's, there's no danger of it leaching out. Is that, is that a possibility that that could be explored or has been explored? Um, thanks, uh, Claire. Uh, to be honest, that's actually a good question uh, that I don't have an answer to. Um, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer to that offhand. I can follow up with that, uh, with, with, um, with national government regarding that, um, unless anyone online would like to, to maybe answer that from a provincial or national. Um, I see we've got Mulalo has said, if it is sent in containers, you will have to encapsulate it. Hi, Claire. Um, um, maybe I can just add to that as well. Um, based on my past experience working in the wastewater treatment sector, in most cases, when you do um, put it in containers and ship it off the landfill, in that case, they do consider it sometimes as hazardous waste and they treat it as hazardous waste and dispose of it as hazardous waste because they have to assess what the content is within that um, encapsulated um, containers and that increases the cost of disposal because hazardous waste yeah. often um, cost it, it costs a lot more to dispose of than your standard waste practices. Okay. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's a good point by your scene is that um, often, I mean, there may, there may be a solution, but it can actually be more expensive than um, than sort of another option uh, that might be cheaper, even though it's a quite an expensive solution, it might just be cheaper to go with that expensive solution than just to encapsulate. But um, yeah, I can follow up with on that. Uh, you said it was Wesley had asked the question. Yeah. So I'd like to unmute uh, Mulalo, uh, trying to unmute. Uh, Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm not going to put on my, my video. I'm still in my pajamas. <laughs> so <laughs> with, re <laughs> with regards to taking it to landfill, adding to what Sam said, yes. So what will happen is that it's going to go in as encapsulation and it will be hazardous waste. But at least that way you prevent it from leaching and interfering with the different layers that's found in the landfill. So I think the bigger picture in this whole thing is that it's not like landfill can't take it. It's, it's the cost associated to taking it to landfill and also the space that it will now require because now you bring it in an IBC, perhaps the IBC is half filled. It needs to be cemented or isolated alone. So it, it's all about cost implications and the, the economic feasibility around that business case. And we had an instance where one of the generators actually built within their plant some sort of, I would say, burning facility, like, like a burner or a boiler 
that he used the feed, um, the, the brine feed to be burned off, you know, so that it becomes, um, in terms of its salt, salt content was much more minimized when he sent the, the waste to landfill. So that's another option for generators that they must consider when they're putting in these plants. And mostly you find that most generators don't take into account the waste cost of putting in this reverse osmosis plants, this wastewater treatment plants, because in the past it used to be cheap, but now things have changed. So yeah. Thank you, thank you, Malala. And um, just to uh, get on the record, what organization are you representing? Um, sorry, I'm, I work for Envarosa Waste Management. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for your, um, your response. I think very relevant. I think that's absolutely accurate. The cost, I think, is often the, the biggest prohibitor. And I think that's also why the emphasis on this particular webinar is around cost-effective uh, solutions. Um, well, thank very you very clear. much. Yeah, Sam, sorry. Sam, yeah, um, Bradley Thorpe also noted something um, which is also relevant is um, if you look at the the norms and standards um, that I was referring to earlier, um, that being the uh, national norms and standards for disposal of waste to landfill. Under section five, where it illustrates the, t the pipeline of uh, waste streams for disposal, um, 5.1 is specifically to streams, but 5.2 sort of gives you a little bit more um, provisions. And one of, uh, so section 5.2.b, um, highlights that macro encapsulation of waste um, is, is essentially uh, as defined as uh, will be banned from uh, 2021. So I'd, I'd also need to have a look at that in a little bit more detail, but that's also another item to, to consider. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And I think also just noting that uh, Joe Burgess from Isle Utilities uh, actually did respond um, to iron around the option of discharging discharging brine to underground mines. Um, it's often considered, but it's very complicated. You have to be sure the brine will not leach or react with the underground geological chemicals and water. So yeah, for a pretty complex space and I think becoming um, significantly more prohibitive as, um, as time goes on. So thank you everyone for that, that brief segue. Um, I'd like to now please hand over to our speakers. Um, so our first speaker is Nigel Bester from Interwaste. So Nigel, if you don't mind getting your um, presentation up and running. Um, so Nigel is the head of effluent process technology at Interwaste. He holds an MSc in engineering management and an MSc in mechanical engineering. He currently designs and implements solutions for both solid and liquid waste treatment with a focus on maximizing recovery and reuse and minimizing waste to landfill. Uh, so I think handing over to, uh, to Nigel. Nigel, are you there? Ah, there we go. Good morning. Okay, can you hand over to me to share? I think it's uh, handed over. Thank you very much. Let me see if the technology works this morning. Is that coming through? Looking good, thank you, Nigel. Excellent, thanks to uh, Everyone, participants, uh, to Green Cape for uh, organizing this and inviting us on this uh, lovely cold morning throughout South Africa. Um, so, yeah, I uh, suppose in short, there is no cheap or easy solution. And uh, that's why we're engaging. We're engaging uh, broadly on this topic. So thanks for this and thanks for the opportunity to present. And, uh, hopefully we can uh, bring some interesting and innovative ideas to the, uh, the stage. So to start, um, let me see if this is up and running here. So the agenda, I will try and keep it short and sweet. We'll basically have a, a brief introduction to the problem. Um, the different grades or the different types of brine that are typically generated through the various industrial processes and treatment technology. Um, a, what we call a holistic approach to the brine management network, uh, to the different streams where you can take them, where we should consider taking them. Um, some proposals we're putting forward, um, and then a short conclusion and a few takeaways. So just to initiate the discussion on uh, the brine management, it's uh, not something that you can do in isolation. Just looking at the, the brine itself immediately initiates a, a holistic view of our water management network. It includes the potable water supply. Um, if we just gave people more water, we could blend away the brine streams and it would be very, very easy. 
um, a waste and effluent discharge, if we allow people to just discharge any specification, again, it takes the problem away, but uh, is not good for the environment. So that is also not an option. Um, local solid and liquid waste landfill, obviously with the challenges incoming, um, not necessarily uh, an easy option to make use of anymore. And uh, we believe that that does need to be looked at. Uh, we will discuss that further down the line in the presentation. And then of course, very importantly, third party support infrastructure, uh, depending where you are and the uh, commercial considerations for each organization. Um, transport costs often factor into this quite heavily and um, these need to be cons um, considered holistically in managing your brine. So to, to maybe get down to the base of it, why is it such a challenge? And uh, what do we mean when we use the word to treat? Um, it's often used all the time, we need to treat the brine, but what do we mean by that? So if we look at the rest of the water treatment industry, when we talk about treating something, it's often around the conversion of chemical compounds. So where we can, we would like to convert something from a hazardous or dangerous state to something less dangerous, a degradation of complex molecules, um, so to break down. Um, and this, this idea of degradation and uh, conversion is uh, nicely shown in um, domestic or effluent wastewater treatment plants where we convert ammonia to nitrates and then nitrates to nitrogen gas. And all of a sudden, through a um, intelligent application of biology, we can make water safe again. Um, often when we treat water, we remove trace contaminants, be it uh, fluoride, iron, manganese, various other um, hundreds of chemicals that we do not want to consume on high levels. Um, or we often, in some cases, choose to concentrate up the water and concentrate the waste for easy disposal. So um, that is also something where we talk about then going into advanced treatment through reverse osmosis, evaporation, as I say, often a combination of the above. And Brian is such a challenge because we can't convert it. We can't really move it to much else. Sodium, you could potentially react to sodium sulfate or something else, but effectively sodium and chlorine effectively reacts to become chloride. Iron, the two bond, it is a base element on the periodic table and um, there's not much really you can do with it. So um, uh, just also an idea on the, uh, the broad range of brine streams we talk about. Uh, a basic stream would be considered brine, 3.5 uh, to 5 percent concentration of sodium chloride, 3.5 um, percent being typical seawater and um, uh, we can go all the way up to about two, uh, 26 um, percent or 260,000 TDS, at which point um, any additional um, dissolved solids would precipitate out. So just to um, set the backdrop on why it is a challenge, a um, bit of a plain word, so not all brine is made equal, just to note that there, there are very large differences in the type of brine generated and the options to treat each type of brine, and these are very intimately linked to our disposal options. So that must be considered when you have a brine stream um, you need to understand and quantify what you have before we can identify the cheapest and most effective way to dispose of it. So to look at some uh, typical generation, so RO meaning reverse osmosis, there's a nice picture there on the right hand side of a typical reverse osmosis plant. So those white pressure vessels are really just um, uh, large pressure, pressure vessels that house the um, typical spiral wound um, membranes and they uh, basically what we use to concentrate up and purify the water. So a typical brine stream I would call would be less than or equal to 500 millisiemens per meter. And this is where you would usually get, a, you may get a permanent discharge to local sewer. So that's really the, the, your best option if you can remain within these um, realms and um, you could discharge locally, it is also the cheapest. Um, Thereafter, if you were to treat that further, you would get a concentrated stream of about 4,000 millisiemens a meter, um, concentrated brine, and that's quite close to around the concentration of seawater itself. Um, if you then have a typical seawater desalination plant, you would start with that and then um, end up with nearly doubling that, uh, depending on your recovery. You'd end up now with the seawater reverse osmosis brine, uh, and those streams are typically sent to sea outfall with a discharge license um, with any operating seawater desalination plant. Uh, modern technology now allows us to push that to about 12 to 13 percent or um, 12,000 uh, millisiemens per meter with the uh, modern ultra high pressure membranes. Um, and now, as you can see from that, so the next stage we'd be looking at evaporation, uh, potentially crystallization, and now you go up to uh, 3,500 um, all the way up to uh, 60 if you are using crystallizers as well. So, 
it's quite important. It depends on where you start, uh, where, what kind of brand you're going to end up, and depending on how you quantify your brand, what we would look to either further treat and potentially transport for disposal, and also obviously uh, this all factors into the uh, commercial decisions made by each organisation. So we would call a bit of a holistic uh, approach is um, any brand generated, really, there's only a few options we have. Um, we need to either safely release it to the environment, being the sewer, the sea, um, that is, so that the liquid discharge, obviously it has to be environmentally friendly, and that's why we're saying safely released. So typical sewer, we've only got a low concentrated brine, and to see, we can run something quite a lot higher um, based on the certain chloride levels in seawater itself. Reuse is always an option. Um, if you have food grade quality um, uh, salt and you don't have uh, other contaminants, um, also now, obviously, there, there's uh, technologies that have been developed to split out um, sodium sulfate separate to, um, if it is in a solution and then running through evaporation crystallization, we could end up with high quality grade sodium sulfate and then separately treat and concentrate up your sodium chloride. Again, it depends on your contaminants and many other issues. Uh, treated before release to environment is really an interim stage and it falls back to the other. That would generate additional water to be recovered and you'd still have to um, either reuse the product, release it to the environment, or send it to landfill. There simply are not more options, um, at least not easily available and commercialized options. So what we have got a high level proposal on the right hand side there is to be ecologically safe, obviously inland and coastal um, discharge to sewer typically, it's less than 500 millisiemens, and that's uh, obviously also volume based. You can't release a very large amount into a river and uh, offset the salinity balance. It also has to be monitored. Uh, coastal, um, anything less than uh, 3,500 millisiemens is um, around the salinity of seawater itself. And if it is a pure, clean sodium chloride solution, um, would pose, in my opinion, very low risk to the receiving environment. And uh, direct, so we have got a proposal there that we should be looking at potentially increasing um, the availability of discharge of clean sodium chloride based brands with low other additional contaminants into tidal rivers. So the upper or lower 10, 20 kilometers of tidal rivers are usually mostly saline, the level of seawater. And then looking at discharge directly to coastal from a potential centralized operator um, and that in the region of three and a half um, to 70,000 millisiemens. So about from the equivalent concentration of seawater to about double. And the post-processing, we're talking there about the brine treatment and then uh, potentially taking to landfill as uh, something that we believe, or I believe still needs to be an option in the final treatment. Um, so then we look at maybe, a, oh, skipping ahead, sorry. Um, we call the uh, bit of a brine life cycle. So looking at uh, where it goes and what do we do with brine, what can we do with it? So that upper region there is really a, a liquid circuit that we're looking at. In the various uh, regions, um, if it's a low concentration brine, we can up concentrate it and create water for reuse. Um, and then once it gets to, uh, depending on our avenues for discharge, we would then release it um, either potentially to tidal rivers, to sewers, and um, we've also got a range of other options that we could look at um, to have centralized treatment, which we also think needs to factor into this. Um, so it's a something for discussion, I believe, later on that we can hopefully get through and um, we can uh, talk about this as uh, something that should be explored further. The, the most important one we're seeing there is the sea outfall. Um, so we'll be discussing that in the next slide and the um, option for landfill, which will be banned shortly. And we believe, I believe, should be revisited as a final option. So in concluding, uh, firstly, if we give two recommendations, avoid generating brine. That is your cheapest solution. Don't make it. Secondly, environmental release to sea outfall of sodium chloride based brine should be considered um, through potentially a third party owned operated um, facility. Um, obviously, we would have to on site ensure compliance to the discharge permits and ensure there's no environmental harm that results from this activity. Uh, potentially, in, in coupled with that uh, environmental release to sea outfall, um, would be a, a centralized processing facility. Um, again, depending on the supporting uh, infrastructure and the surrounding uh, industry, uh, the users that will make use of this facility. So when we say centralized thermal brine treatment facility, um, 
as Jane uh, noted, uh, the capital and operational costs for um, thermal evaporation and treatment are extensive and centralizing facilities, there are economies of scale that would uh, bring reduced costs potentially to certain uh, users. And um, for larger users, of course, exploring on-site advanced treatment um, and then looking at the economic viability of on-site treatment and sharing third-party treatment facilities. Some of the challenges that uh, we've encountered on, on this quest, if we can call it, to potentially access sea outfalls is um, they usually are intimately coupled to, um, uh, it's uh, basically a coastal discharge permit that's issued to a specific user. Um, strict adherence is required and um, it, it's not something that a third party would, or that uh, third party access would be given easily. Those permits are given for specific activities and specific water qualities to be um, released. So the large industrial clients, you would see large uh, fish farms or potentially um, large petrochemical facilities that are at uh, coastal levels would have these kind of um, uh, access to sea outfall. Uh, municipal wastewater plants, uh, usually to river or potentially directly. Um, seawater desalination plants, of course, uh, would be uh, very close to the amount of water they produce in potable. The equivalent amount of concentrated brine would be released every day. Of course, stormwater discharge as well. So some challenges in this, of course, is around reputational damage and operational risk um, in bringing in third party, almost called unknown streams. Uh, a lot of testing needs to be done. And usually it's just not economically viable or a risk that um, third party operators would be willing to, uh, basically uh, would be willing to take on. Transport costs, of course, are also quite prohibitive depending on the location. So it's something to be considered. In concluding, um, I think a very, very important note that driving legislation to push for the thermal treatment or advanced treatment of brine is not necessarily environmentally friendly. We actually use an incredible amount of energy in South Africa generated from coal um, to the electricity. That is actually, we're driving up the release of CO2 emissions by driving the treatment of brine too far. And we need to look at a holistic approach, not just in terms of the water, but uh, in terms of the CO2 emissions that will be generated through additional treatment of brine. Um, increased efficiency, of course, uh, increased potable water availability. People are able to um, extract more from the water they use and release less, um, allows more water onto the grid. Um, reduced brine and concentrated brine to landfill. Um, well, I think that goes without saying, but uh, it's very important to know that um, we still need to have access to landfill we believe as a final destination for concentrated or potentially contaminated brine streams. Um, ecological environmental integrity is I think the focus of the entire legislation and what we're trying to ensure and an important one, um, driving up the costs of doing business. Uh, we're in a time when South Africa needs jobs and we need to be competitive as a country and um, we need to do this while being environmentally friendly and environmentally focused. Like we need to enable business with I think, legislation that makes sense and with options. So thank you very much. We'll hand over to the next, uh, next speaker. Um, thank you very much, Nigel. I really appreciate that, uh, that presentation. Um, I think really outlined some of the complexity around this um, and some interesting proposals that you put on the table there that we'd like to, I think, pick up a little bit in the Q&A session uh, because really some interesting food for thought in terms of that uh, third party discharge outfall. Um, we're now going to be handing over to Forrester De Beer to um, set up his presentation. Um, Forrest, if you wouldn't mind uh, getting things up and running on your side while I, while I introduce you. Um, so Forrester is the founder and principal engineer at Forrester De Beer & Associates, which is a consulting practice operating in plant design and engineering sectors. He is a registered professional engineer and has interests in heat transfer, energy, liquid waste treatment and green technologies. He also owns Mechanox South Africa, a company that designs, manufactures and sells heat exchanges. Uh, so Forrest is also going to be um, presenting on some of the ideas and options that he's explored um, within his organization. Forrester, are you there? Ah, there we go. Mm. Hello. Hi, right, good morning.
Hi, good day everybody. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about um, how to treat waste in, in a pilot plant that we've been operating on various brine waste um, over, the, over the last two years. Um, the process that we've looked at is a it's an evaporation process and then um, it makes use of a, a mechanical vapor compressor. The, the main reason for using that technology is um, we get a thermodynamic um, efficiency that allows us to evaporate um, brine containing waste and, and that is very, very energy efficient. Um, what's, what we find is the CRP is in, in excess of 10 for the process. So you could get the equivalent using um, 10 kilowatts, you could get 100 kilowatts of evaporation capacity. So the main brines that we've treated um, have been various, from pharmaceutical waste right through to saline discharge from well water. Um, and we found that the reduction ratio is very high. Um, so we can concentrate something to the point where it becomes um, a crystal. So um, the, the problem is if we concentrate any more, we can't um, pump it through our system. So the theoretical limit is, is solid. Um, it actually can become solid in the system. It's a simple process. Um, we have a tank. Um, we put the, the brine in a tank. It's um, then evacuated with a compressor. It then compresses it through a heat exchanger, and then that is then discharged back into the vessel at a higher temperature. The steam that we draw off the waste um, then compressed and the temperature rises. And that thermodynamic process creates a, a sustainable process that uses very little energy. The only energy that we're putting in is to try and compress a motor. Um, on aqueous brines, we find the results extremely good. So the the condensate that we get out of there is is almost pure water. Um, if the brine, con um, sorry, I've got a PC problem. Um, if the brine The brine um, is, is um, doesn't contain any any um, matters that evaporate at the sort of same temperature as water does. Then um, we get a very good condensate onto the system. It's a single step process, so we don't have to. We can take fairly um, poor brine into the system. It evaporates as long as the the brine is pumpable, it, it can um, be treated and evaporated off. Costs, um, as Nigel mentioned earlier, costs can be quite high. The treatment costs are about 200 to 220 um, rand per meter cube. And this um, will only be um, applicable in, in um, you know, areas where high processing costs of brine are expected. And as mentioned before, there's a few steps in the process. At most, there's um, sort of three steps. One is a pre-treatment, so we might fil filter fairly large articles out of the brine, and then we treat it, and then there might be a post um, step just to um, to treat the, the brine afterwards or treat the condensate. The benefits is that we can get um, very high reduction of, of brine, as I mentioned earlier, and the condensate coming out is certainly better than what can be discharged to council. Um, mostly the water can be reused, and um, in certain instances it, it is actually purer than, um, it's, a, it's a purified water. Um, we find with um, saline brines that the water quality coming out is, is 
extremely good at actually better than municipal quality. Disadvantages um, is it uses a lot of energy. Um, but I think if you've got renewable energy sources, um, that could be an attractive option um, that we could use this um, to, to drive the process. Um, certain brines can't be treated if they have oils and um, things like that in, um, you struggle then to um, get a good evaporation process underway. I'm just going to go through a few findings and results that we found on the brines we treated on the, the pilot plant. Um, we treated hazardous aqueous waste. That was something that is um, extremely poisonous. It's something that we typically go to an incinerator for treatment. Um, we found that that treatment, we got water quality off there that was suitable to go to municipal discharge. So it met all the requirements of municipal discharge quality. And it was at the treatment cost well below um, taking it to a landfill and um, treating it in that sort of environment. As I mentioned earlier, saline brine, the RO discharge um, well water, we treated that and the quality coming out there was extremely good. And there we achieved a greater than 90% reduction in the discharge quantity. So um, we were able to treat that. And it also um, increased the, the output of the plant because the water that we got out of the system was able to go and join the RO stream. We treated landfill each shape. Um, it was extremely poor quality, almost. Um, and there we also got quality um, which was able to be discharged to sewer and met all council requirements. We've also done um, town water that's taking normal municipal water, um, something with uh, about 140 um, milli siemens, and we treated that um, to pure water at um, the evaporation process where we've got less than five micro uh, millisiemens on that. Um, we found the following um, as well, challenges with the MDR, brine constituents. Um, some brines, as Nigel mentioned, aren't equal. Um, we found some brines have um, certain things that make it extremely corrosive to um, metals. And that does give us a lot of challenges. It means that exotic metals need to be used in the construction of the mechanical vapor compressor. Saline brine um, was also easy to treat. Again, salt at high temperature does become very corrosive. So it, it just needs to be borne in mind when you're selecting materials for the piece of equipment. Um, Obviously, salt, solid salt is very hard to get rid of. Um, so that would need a second step treatment or find a, a stream for the crystalline salt. Um, what we did find is certain brines, if they contain certain organic um, substances in, they do tend to foam, which is a problem for the compressor. Um, so that just needs to be borne in mind and testing done ahead of, ahead of time. Other approaches that we've um, sort of had a brief look, look at um, is to convert some of the brines into a useful product. Um, these are looking at small scale um, Electro electrolysis to, to try and convert some of these salines into other materials. Um, it's also a very expensive process, but I think if it's done on larger scale with um, renewable energy sources, it could be um, an attractive option. Um, some of the other areas that um, are being used is collaboration with other companies where you could um, use the brine as a, or the, the solid brine as a, as a feedstock into their process. 
Um, say that Brian can also um, why the trolleys is to use for an acid plant um, generation where you develop hydrochloric acid or but that would require the trolleys process. Um, landfill leachate, um, we found a lot of um, useful minerals in the landfill leachate which could be separated using some process and that could also be useful. And then organic compounds um, found in certain brines um, could also be recyclable and reused or put to a, a bioreactor. What we did find was that um, the main benefit of the mechanical vapor compressor was the high concentration. So we could take um, a very large stream and reduce it to a very small stream. And these um, streams could be done at the client site. So we could put the equipment down on their site and um, reduce the stream at source. And um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Forrester. Um, I really do um, appreciate that presentation um, and outlining some of the options there. Um, we're going to, if you don't mind stopping your presentation now, we're going to open it up to our interactive session. Um, so I'd like to, um, so Forrester, you're going to obviously stick around and Nigel as well. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, two of our additional panelists. Um, first, Henry Roman. Um, so Henry is the Director of Environmental Services and Technologies Directorate at the Department of Science and Innovation. He has 15 years experience in the National System of Innovation in various roles with nine of these at the Department of Science and Innovation. He has led the development of two roadmaps related to the green economy ambitions of South Africa to guide research development and innovation in the water and waste sectors. He's also commissioned the first green technology landscape report for South Africa contact, conducted by ASAF, as well as the first of its kind green R&D investment survey conducted by TIPS. He is currently working on developing an SDI framework for the circular economy. Good day, Henry. Um, we also have Dr. Valerie Naidu, who is from the Water Research Commission. She completed her master's and PhD degrees from the University of KwaZulu-Natal and Pollution Research Group and the Department of Chemical Engineering with extensive experience in wastewater systems. She joined the, Waste, the Water Research Commission in 2008 and is currently the Executive Manager of Business Development and Innovations. Valerie is the past president of the Water Institute of Southern Africa and the previous chair of the board of the Water Institute of Southern Africa. So thank you everyone for uh, joining in this particular discussion. Um, I'd like to pose some questions uh, to the panelists. Um, and while I'm doing that, um, I know there have been a few questions that have been posed within the group chat. Um, I will revert back to them and, and direct them to the correct um, respondents. Um, but please continue to um, ask questions. And, um, and uh, I'm really enjoying this, this interactive conversations that are happening in, in the chat on, on the side there. Um, so, I mean, I think as you, as you can all understand, uh, one of the key reasons we have brought the likes of Henry and Valerie um, into this into this conversation is that there's there's this is a significant challenge um, and it's it's not easily solvable at least from a cost of, in a cost effective manner and um, from the the amount of inquiries that we as Green Cape are receiving from industries um, that, are, that are really kind of querying what to do around this, what are the opportunities around, you know, perhaps uh, uh, potential off takers of this brine. There's, there's actually, there's a lot of uh, work and I think a lot of concern on the, on the perspective of industries around this uh, 2021 uh, legislation that's coming in. Um, so we feel that there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of looking at innovation and looking at uh, perhaps new solutions and, and areas that need to be looked at um, because this is a significant challenge that's not going away anytime soon. Um, so first of all, I would like to um, hand over to Valerie 
Um, and if Valerie, if you don't mind very briefly, um, just noting what it is your organization does in fostering innovation and brand management solutions. And um, if you've seen any promising solution opportunities that could help address this challenge, perhaps they're not a commercial stage at this point, um, but is there anything that you, that you see has, has got potential? Valerie, are you there? Thanks, Claire. Um, so I'm from the Water Research Commission, and our job largely is around protection of water resources, uh, but also to look at new um, and alternate water sources for the future. So most of you that are sitting here today uh, would know that for us, uh, water security is paramount, and then pre prevention of pollution of those water sources is equally paramount. And so the issues that we are facing both in terms of uh, whether we're dealing with seawater and RO processes in order to get extra water into our supply systems, or whether we are talking about using, uh, you know, different filtration ultra uh, nano or, or RO processes for brackish water treatment, again, to get extra water supply into our system. And then probably the biggest issue is is inland where we're dealing with a lot of acid mine drainage and they generate tons and tons of um, brine. And we've reaching that point, and I think from all the presentations today, it kind of has put us in that space, isn't it? It's at that decision point. It's an extremely complex problem. It's going to require cooperation and collaboration. And it's probably going to be uh, requiring a kind of collaboration and cooperation, which is not that not one that we're used to. Because we're very typically as a country used to creating regulations and then handing over to different people to do stuff. For me, I think the problem is so big and could have such major challenges in terms of um, you know, stopping it from going to the landfill that businesses have to organize to work together and collaborate. I think the guys that provide technologies and solutions need to organize and, and work together. I think universities that are bringing some of the emerging technologies, again, have to become part of uh, those groups of people that are trying to find the solutions. In South Africa, we have one thing, we, we give quite a bit of uh, research funding around certain areas. What we don't find is venture capital when technologies are closer to technology readiness level seven, eight, and nine. And I'm not talking public sector funding. I'm talking where private sector comes in, whether you the person that's generating the waste or whether you the person that's providing the solution, I would like to see more of that interaction to try and solve something as, as difficult as this. So uh, Claire, you spoke a little bit around uh, what we kind of do in terms of research. Over the years, we've uh, researched a lot around because brine gets stored in, in, in ponds. So we've researched a lot in how, how, how can we what should I say, extend the life of the pond. So in that space, we've tried, um, you know, universities have tried things like wind-aided intensification, evaporation. They've tried humid humidification processes called vaporization. Again, still early stage, uh, and it has some uh, opportunity, but again, we haven't really taken it up to the scale up. Of course, at the WRC, we've monitored the different technologies because not only should you watch what you use as a technology to treat brine, you should also be looking at the feedstock and what are the pre-treatment steps that allow you to then treat brine or create a value product at the end. So the entire value chain becomes important around your technology fits as you move towards what I call the beneficiation or zero liquid effluent discharge. So in that space, we've got quite a bit of work on the evaporation ponds. We've got quite a bit of work around brine uh, technologies, scaled up to quite a, quite a level. But I think we always fall short in terms of complete funding to almost finish the puzzle, to, to get to that stage where we can, we can find uh, the right solutions. And we have spent quite a bit of time as well on uh, trying to understand uh, essentially how to look at the different options. So is it just RO or can I use biological systems? Or is chemical systems producing less waste? Uh, so these are all the kind of decisions we have to make as we start choosing the solutions. But those solutions have to be chosen for the type of feedstock that comes in. 
because it will then create a type of brine which will then need to be treated by a certain type of technology. I think I'll stop there. Mm. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Valerie. I really appreciate um, those compelling thoughts. Um, I think as you uh, would have noticed, we are having some issues with the screen sharing. Um, we are trying to sort out those technical glitches on our side, so I do apologize um, for that. Um, but if you are able to um, look at your participants on full screen, um, that's, that, may, that may help you. Um, but in the interim, I think we'd like to hand over to, to um, Henry. So I'm going to ask you very, uh, a very similar question. Um, so, I mean, how does your organization um, play a role within uh, fostering innovation in brine management solutions? And what have you seen come up, um, if there's anything else around, um, around new innovations and opportunities that could help address this challenge? Uh, so anything over and above what, what Valerie has mentioned already? Um, over to you, um, Henry. Thanks, Claire. Um, I'll, I'll, at the outset, uh, make it clear that what Valerie has said, I can't really build on. And the reason for that is quite simple. Um, the WRC and the DSI have a partnership on two, two important um, programs. One is the Water RDI Roadmap. Um, they're the implementing partner on that one. And the other is the WADA platform. The WADA platform is where we... we demonstrate and um, new, new tech water technologies. So, that, so in that instance, I defer to, that, to, to Valerie's expertise on it as, as she's much closer and everything that our department is funding in that space is actually being implemented through the WRC as well. However, to, to let the audience know what our department does because not many people know what the DSI does. They would know what environmental affairs are doing in this space, as well as what water affairs are doing in this space. So from a, a Department of Science and I Innovation side of things, so in March 2019, Cabinet approved the white paper on science and science, technology and I I innovation as government po like policy. So it's not the white paper of the DSI, it's the government's white paper to address this. So it also, it, it sets the long-term policy direction for, for, our, for the South African government to ensure the growing role of science, tech and innovation to, to build a more prosperous and inclusive society. And I think that part, the inclusive society part, I'll come back to again. So we, and hence our name changed. Prior to, to the white paper being approved, we used to be known as the DST. So technology was, was one of the, the drivers we focused on quite a lot. Now we're focusing on the innovation landscape in South Africa. So how do we use STI to accelerate inclusive economic growth? How do we use it to make our economy more effective? But also how do we use STI to improve people's daily lives? So the socioeconomic benefit that can come from a, 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 very, a good systemic response. So we're also looking, um, one of the things we're doing is, is, is developing a decadal plan. The decadal plan is, will be the implementation plan of the DSI response to the white paper. And one of the things we're looking at is, is taking a whole of society approach to innovate to innovate innovation we're calling it an innovation compact much like if, for those who, who may know we had a, a green economy accord that was signed i think in 2011 where it was business government and labor came together and made an, and, and put in place this accord um, we, we're not yet to discuss the merits of whether it worked or not but similar thinking in just getting an innovation compact. But however, we also need to work across government because all departments, so it's, it's looking at how do we look at policies related to innovate, innovation such as trade, competition, education, and procurement. Because if you're looking from a circular economy perspective or green economy perspective, if you really want to push that the, the green technologies and, 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 
and, sol and sol solutions, government procurement has a role to play. Um, that, that, that's why we want to look at how do we do that. Um, we're also looking at um, how the white paper will support the legislative framework. For instance, the one that, that falls under our department is the IPR Act, the Intellectual Property Rights Act of 2008, that governs how publicly funded research is used to, to manage that IP. Um, also looking at local innovation ecosystems. So we're looking at grassroots type innovation and the district model, the district coordination model that the presidency is, is put forward because we need to, we, we, we are a national department without a local footprint. So it's how do we engage with, with provincial departments? How do we engage with, even with municipalities for innovation? Mm. Um, the NACI Foresight Report, um, which is the basis for the decadal plan that, that we're busy developing at the moment, has identified both, both circular economy and water security as priorities for the decadal plan. The reason that I bring the two together is because the work under the waste roadmap is laying a, a good foundation for a transition to circular economy. But looking at it, so, so looking at the two, we need to, it, to, let me start again. So the reason for looking at the two is we cannot address the issue in isolation. We cannot just look at brine as brine and or as part of a water problem or only as part of a waste problem. You have to look at it holistic, like, like um, was it Nigel was pointing out, we need a holistic solution. Um, and, and that's sort of the stance that at the moment, that's what we're taking. Um, in terms of opportunities, more stringent legislation should not only be looked at as a problem, but it actually presents an opportunity for us to potentially create new economic streams. Um, because if you're looking at the Brian, I've been watching the conversation unfold on the chat. There may be opportunities, business opportunities can be realized. What Yassin was talking about, the industrial symbiosis um, way of addressing the problem is what we should be looking at. Um, I think I'll end there as well. Hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you, Henry. And I think that um, there's, there's obviously a real need for increased collaboration and cooperation of, uh, amongst um, uh, various uh, departments and diff different sectors of, uh, of the economy, as well as the, the country, to be able to solve for this problem. Um, I, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, as, um, as the Department of Science and Innovation, are you looking to play an active role in helping facilitate some of those those collaborations? Um, or perhaps this is even a question for Valerie but as well, but this, this, there really seems to be a need for an overarching um, approach that is being led you know, by some strong leadership in this area to be able to move this forward. Or are, are we looking for a much more um, uh, a kind of a, a organic approach to be taken place? Um, well, to start with, in the way we're approaching the decadal plan is through the priorities identified by NACI. So we're picking the ones that we see as having the most impact over the 10 years to come. But we're taking a missions approach. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the mission approach that the EU is currently undertaking, the sort of moonshot way of looking at, at, at societal problems as well as envi envir environmental ones. So it will not just be us. So what we're doing is we're saying, here's the role for DSI in terms of science, tech, and in innovation. However, to make this work in the system, DTI, you are responsible for certain things. Water and sanitation, you are responsible for certain things. In envi environmental affairs, we will product we can provide you the evidence base to improve the regulations and the policy making in the let's say in the waste sector so that's one of the, that's the approach we come in with because we also sit as a department we sit within the economic cluster for for government so 
economic recovery um, post COVID and looking at the downgrade we, we, we got just during that time as well. So economic recovery is top of mind. And alternative models for the economic recovery for the country is one of the things that as a Department of Science and in, in, in Innovation, we are looking at circular economy as one of the models that potentially can lead to that because of its inclusive nature as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to see, I see Valerie would like to respond to that as well. Valerie, if you don't mind. Look, I think that even though in our, uh, the way we work, we're supposed to have corporate governance uh, at government levels, whether it's national as well as local. For me, what I'm calling for is a more sophisticated way in which we organize, uh, both as industry, academia, uh, the different entities, as well as the national department. So let me give you an example. If we look at the mine water issue inland, and maybe some of the diesel uh, issues that you are having around brackish water treatment, it's largely left to the, indi the individual municipality or the individual department. And then they're asked to deal with it in terms of their budgets. But this is not a one, one department budget that has to deal with it. This is, is something a little bit more that needs to occur because we've reached a stage where you can regulate, but if you don't have the options on the table that are cost effective for business to move forward, it means they needs to be more than just a discussion about the protection of the environment. Not that I'm saying stop the regulation, I'm saying increase the collaboration mm -hmm. and increase the collaboration. This is not a Department of Water and Sanitation problem. This is together with Department of Environment Affairs. This is about COPTA and municipalities, but it is also about the large industries that are producing the brand and it's about the companies that are providing the solutions. And, and I think therein lies a, 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 a much more sophisticated model that's required to bring these guys together rather than saying, I've paid my tax and it's your problem and you need to find a pipe that I can put this brine into. And then it becomes your problem to deal with. Let me tell you that the municipalities right now, their municipal systems, there is no reinvestment cost into their wastewater treatment plants. So there's no space to continually pump uh, high salt waters into their wastewater treatment plants. They can barely deal with all the other things. So they're not putting in the uh, increased unit processes to deal with it. They don't have the luxury of putting an RO, pro, uh, RO process at the end of their effluent treatment to, to kind of clean up the, whatever Brian is in, in that system. So I, what I'm saying here is it is a complex problem, but it's a com complex problem that we all share. And the Department of Science and Technology can support and that Water Research Commission can support the research, but academics and, 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 and uh, should I say innovators, tech companies, uh, industries that produce the waste and all the other guys need to come together and say, how do we solve this? Because we need a solution at the end of it, not just the regulation. Mm, okay. So I guess that's really the, the call to action. I think there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And what I'm hearing from you, Valerie, is it's, it's not necessarily going to be led by government. It's going to have to be quite a big push from a number of different institutions that are being impacted from this, but there needs to be a very solution oriented approach to it. Um, and I think that's going to be the, the key um, um, issue here. Um, I'd like to perhaps uh, move over to some of the other questions that we received um, in the chat. And I wanted to direct one of them to Nigel, if, if that's okay. Um, and Nigel, you can obviously let me know if, you, if you're not equipped to be able to respond to this. But in terms of some of the um, um, existing coastal discharge facilities, um, what are the what are the options around receiving tankered brine for discharge through those through those uh, um, outfall pipelines? Um, I could give my thoughts on it, but I uh, do not believe I am well equipped to offer that um, in terms of answering it. I can give from a technical perspective um, and a management perspective. Um, the current coastal water permits are issued to specific users. Um, and their intended use is very, very um, specific. So if it is a, a fish farm or a petrochemical facility and under the environmental impact, they would have to detail the, the water quality to be released and the, um, the activity that they're undergoing. 
once you open up this realm of questions or this uh, proposal, we would have to have a different discussion in terms of the ERA and operation and the monitoring of the incoming waste. So I think the challenge is really to frame this in a, in a way that the operator would be a, um, a multi-purpose recipient, or well, this is the proposal of potentially concentrated brands and compliant brand streams could be blended and released where environmentally friendly. And potentially we could couple this with a centralized treatment facility that would further treat uh, where needed, um, potentially removing um, heavy metals or uh, separating out sodium sulfates with uh, speciality membranes, leaving the sodium chloride there. So that's kind of a, the cheapest solution that is, I think, holistic. However, um, I see my colleague Bradley in the chat is just mentioning we still come to the end of the line that we need somewhere to take the concentrated final salt. Um, someone asked a question there on the evaporator. Yes, uh, we are not, we're not uh, processing out the sodium chloride or something else unless we have a nuclear reactor. It, we're just concentrating it. If it's a high quality, we take it to reuse as the first option, multiple uses of salt. If it's a low quality or contaminated, we need an option to take it my opinion potentially to landfill. So I so, um, don't know if that answers the question in a kind of a holistic way that we're trying to put together thought. Um, the, the challenge is at the moment, uh, third parties would not, uh, I, I would not, if it was my business, accept someone else's brine without extensive testing. And even if I did at that point, um, I don't believe you would be compliant to your discharge permit because that would not be a waste that would be originating from your activities necessarily. So it would be a new proposal and a new discharge pipeline that would operate under a different premise. Okay. And then when, would you see opportunities under that kind of framework for uh, uh, approach to be taken through a public, par um, public, private public partnership? Um, because it feels like there's, there's a lot of risk on both sides, um, but we, we need some funding to be able to get this uh, collaborative um, an aggregated brine offer to, to make sense, but it doesn't, it sounds like a single organization by themselves are probably not going to take this on entirely. Is, would you say that's a, an approach that might be viable? I, I think that's absolutely, if we can set the framework for it, um, I'm sure there would be a number of um, potentials for um, investors to come on board and look at various payback models, um, if we can build the framework around the, the costing of brine, the, the receiving the brine on would industry be um, agreeable with the pricing structures and the models and is there a market that would uh, lead towards um, using this facility. Um, we'd probably be talking if we included just the operation of the pipeline and a potential large um, uh, mechanical vapor recompression or coupling that with a crystallizer, um, a multiple hundred million rand investment. And I think if we could set the framework, a partnership would be good. Um, obviously, we would have to avoid a monopoly forming on this where um, pricing could be manipulated by a single operator. Um, but uh, I definitely think that is an option that uh, we're proposing as a strong solution for at least coastal regions to safely uh, manage and process um, the majority of the brine that is generated. Okay. Sure, that's a, it's a, big, uh, a big project to achieve under very short time frames as well. I guess that's the, that's the key challenge as well. Um, so I just wanna see, um, do we have any of our colleagues from the city of Cape Town on the call at the moment that may be able to speak to some of the local um, legislation? Um, just trying to see if Nokuzula is on here. I'm not, I'm not seeing her there. Okay. Um, so I think I would be very good to, um, to see if there are any other, um, if there are any other opportunities to, to explore around evaporation. Um, is there, is there, a, is there any other um, option around utilizing um, evaporators as a, as a viable industrial wastewater treatment option within South Africa? You know, coupling that with some interesting um, energy alternatives, et cetera. So I'm, I'm referring this to, to Forrester, um, you know, th particularly thinking about your inland um, issues, et cetera. Is this, is this a potential area that, that could be explored further, that further innovation could, could, uh, it, could be, it could be ready for? Or have we reached kind of the end in terms of, of what's possible on that, uh, on that particular technology um, pathway? I'm not sure, was that a question framed 
can I try and beat that or um, yeah, who did I you frame the question to? I was, I was uh, responding to Forrester, but I don't see him anywhere. Um, I was asking that to Forrester. But Maybe yeah, give it a brief, a brief response to that, that um, yeah. the, the, the technology around um, evaporation and crystallization is, is very mature globally. Um, packaged equipment is available from several suppliers to handle anything from uh, 500 kilograms a day to uh, 500 to 1,000 tons. Packaged equipment pre-engineered and assembled on site. For larger installations, uh, custom built um, evaporation is available as well from several large industrial players globally. It's, it's very mature, it's, it's a technology, and um, I, it's a very competitive space as a mature industry. And I don't believe there's extensive room for innovation. There's always room for innovation, but as a mature industry that is highly competitive, um, for instance, it's not, it's not an environment or a, a game that I would like to be involved with directly as a manufacturer um, due to the competition globally. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel, for that response. I see Forrester has, uh, is back again. Hi, Forrester. Hi, hi. I, I don't know if you'd like to add anything to, to Nigel's response. Um, I agree with Nigel. It is a mature technology, and that's typically why we looked at it for um, our pilot plant. Um, and yeah, it's um, what we found that it's very easy technology um, to use and implement. We built a pilot plant quite easily. Um, we source the components and they're all standard engineering devices, compressors, things that everybody knows. And so it's mature, robust technology. And unfortunately, it is expensive from an energy point of view. Um, you know, these, these things do use a lot of energy. But I think if you've got um, solar energy um, that you could use to, to drive the process, I think... From that point of view, it could become quite attractive. Um, I, I think it's a clear case for concentrating brine. Um, and I think if we look at the downstreaming of the concentrate or crystals that come out of the process, then um, I, I think that's where we need to you know, put the effort and research in, how, how to treat these downstream things that cannot go to, to the ample. Um, we've briefly looked at, um, at, at things where we can try and convert it um, using electrolysis. It's also a robust, well-known technology, and uh, there are companies overseas using it. Um, it also uses a lot of energy, but you know the stuff that comes out of it is um, is useful. And like um, Marshall said, you need to get rid of all the contaminants, um, things like, um, you know, the, the tramp metals, uh, the sodiums and the sulfates and stuff that come with. Um, but I'm sure these are all processes that can be set up and, and research work done around that. But you're going to need, um, I think, the commercial um, aspects of it is that, um, you know, somebody needs to find a business case for this to go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and until that happens, I don't think much is going to come off the ground. Um, I'm not sure if there are any um, research programs done by a um, CSIR or somebody on, on this sort of treatment. Um, but I've, we've done some research into work that was done in India um, where people are converting high um, concentrate brines into, into a cement process um, using a, a particular cement. Um, and um, that that's, um, is, is currently um, seeing, receiving kind of a, a bit of attention. Um, but, you know, there could be um, processes developed where you could um, look at, at trying to get saline um, solutions into, into the, the cement industry and then make bricks or something like that where you essentially encapsulate the, the salt into a, into a building material. Um, mm. But yeah, um, it's, it's 
it's a, a real problem in how to get rid of salt. Um, and I don't believe dumping it in the ocean is, is a good approach either. Um, you know, um, you know, pumping it out to the ocean is going to affect somewhere, um, especially around the end of the pipeline. You'll get my saline, and you'll have an environmental impact at that point. So, um, you know, as a as an engineer, I think let's see if there are some economic drivers for it, and and try and develop the process around that. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, really, really tricky issue here. Um, I'd actually like to address a question to someone else um, on the on the um, webinar, if that's okay. So, Joe, uh, I, Joe Burgess, I saw that you uh, you posted a, a question uh, or a statement relating to um, effectively freezing as opposed to to heating. Um, uh, Joe and and I and Forrester mentioned some work that's been done in India. I'd be really interested to know from your side, do you guys review technologies um, from across the globe? Um, and, and I mean, this can't, we can't be the only country that is facing this particular challenge. Um, and I'd really like to know if, this, if there are alternatives that have been explored in a viable manner, or if really the, the key um, solution and way forward is really thinking through what are the potential off takers from from this uh, waste stream um, or it's into the ocean? I mean, where what, what are the other opportunities that have been explored internationally? Okay. Sorry um, to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Thanks, Claire. Um, much appreciated. Yes, indeed. We, we do look at a, a range of technologies um, and there are some uh, which are commercially available, very few at the moment, primarily offered in South Africa um, and the Netherlands. And then there are a few which are at sort of TRL between six and eight, so pre-commercial stage. Um, they've been proven to be feasible in decent sized pilot plants in operational conditions. Um, and in South Africa, most of those demonstration plants are out in the Mpumalanga High Felt and being tried in the mining sector. Um, so there are, there are two basic different formats for freeze desalination and they, they both work by taking the temperature of the brine solution down to the point, um, a desired temperature point. And you can do it one of two ways. If you drop the temperature to, it's actually slightly below um, zero degrees Celsius, then you can seed with ice crystals, pure water ice crystals effectively, and you can nucleate the precipitation of bigger ice crystals around those, those ice crystals. And much like your, um, your ice cube and your rum and coke at the end of a busy week, they will float to the top and you can skim off the ice slurry. And when that melts, that's basically pure water. Um, as the temperature decreases, different salts freeze or come out of solution at different temperatures. So you can do one of two things at that point. You can either drop the temperature in stages. So you can extract, for example, sodium chloride, magnesium sulfate, calcium carbonate, at different points is relatively pure form, so between 95 and 99% pure. And you can extract them separately as separate solid products. And those can go into the bulk chemical industry if it's a salt that there is a, a market pull for. Um, or if there is an insufficient concentration of any of the salts to do anything useful with, you can take the temperature down to something like, um, you can super cool to something around the minus 10 degrees mark and then you will precipitate out the rest of your salts as a mixed solid. Uh, and then it's a case of immobilizing that solid and disposing of it in an encapsulated or immobilized form. It doesn't get you away from the disposal problem, but mm. it does mean you have a much smaller um, volume to deal with and it's in a solid form so that you, your issues with mobilization of the dangerous um, components of the solid residue um, becomes a much smaller problem. To my mind, the most attractive way of doing it is the first one, where you use the eutectic point of each individual salt and you pull off um, the salts as independent products. Obviously, then you have issues with access to market, whether there actually is a market for that much salt. Um, and there are sometimes issues with contaminants. If the freezing point of two salts in the brine solution, um, if the two freezing points are very close together, it can be very difficult to separate out the salts and you might need a downstream process that solubilizes one of them, for example, um, or you can have engineered ligands 
that extract one of the salts from solution and, and re-precipitate it in a different form. Um, but it's energetically much more affordable. Um, the eutectic phase crystallization has been done at a sort of 10 megalitre a day size. And the energy demand has been shown to be between six and 20 times lower than thermal evaporation, depending on the, the salts you're extracting in your, your heat recycle loops. Um, so that's, that's the thing I'm most excited about at the moment when it comes to, to brine management. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was very interesting. And it's very interesting to, to note that I guess South Africa, it sounds like, is, is kind of at the forefront of a lot of this, uh, a lot of this work. And um, uh, Jane just noted that we actually have um, Professor Alison Lewis on the call as well from UCT. Um, who is the lead re researcher um, from on eutectic uh, freeze technology? Um, so, um, Alison, I don't know if you if you if you're able to say hello as well. Um, but yes, uh, it's... I'm very happy to respond. I'll be very brief. Thank you. Um, Joe is actually oops, sorry, blocked. There I am. Joe has actually given a great response. Thank you so much, Joe. I couldn't have expressed it better myself. But yes, we're still working in the field. Um, I think um, I was quite surprised actually by the earlier discussion in that there's so much focus on disposal and so little focus on actual treatment. And our view is that treatment for recovery and reuse is the future and that the sooner we get our heads around that, the better. As Valerie said, the more cooperation and partnerships we start around developing these solutions, where they start to become viable um, I think that's the way to go. Um, if anybody's interested in exploring this further, I'm very happy to share um, papers we've published. Um, all the research we've done is in public domain uh, through Water Research Commission reports and so on. So they're very welcome to contact me at GCT. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn and I'm very happy to share. So thank you. I mean, it's been a great webinar so far. Thank you very much, Alison, um, for, for noting that, because I think it's, it's a perfect segue into to, uh, closing off this uh, discussion. So, um, you know, we, as I noted at the beginning of the webinar, we really want to encourage people to connect with each other, um, hence the inclusion of your organizational name in, the, in your name on the participant list. Um, and I'd really, if you would like to be connected with anyone else, um, uh, after this webinar, please send an email through to Jane. Uh, you should all have her email address, uh, jane at greencape.co.za, um, and she can connect you. Uh, because we'd like to keep these conversations going. I think it's, it's been very clear from this that there's a number of challenges that exist, and the only way that we're going to be able to solve for them um, is to work together in a far more collaborative manner. And it sounds like there's a lot of work that needs to be done around market development. There needs to be a lot of thinking that needs to happen around disposable, disposal. Um, and I think there has to be a lot of work done between the municipalities um, and the industry that, that are within uh, those, those municipalities, because um, to the best of our knowledge, you know, a lot of the government and municipalities themselves are actually the largest generators of a lot of this brine, and they don't necessarily have a viable solution for them. Um, so I think that there is, there is a vested interest from a number of different participants um, in the sector to be able to find viable solutions, but it, we can't do it alone. I mean, I think Nigel's articulation of in th that particular solution around a, um, a coastal discharge is going to cost hundreds of millions of rands. That's, that's not money that's, that's easily found in this current economic environment. Um, but there are, of course, opportunities to think much more extensively about reuse of, of this brine and to, and to really explore areas where there are also greater synergies between various different market players for the use of the, of the brine disposal. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for your participation and your attendance at this event. We will send around the uh, presentations as noted previously, and we will upload some of the comments and key insights from this event onto our website. And of course, we'll email everyone with that. And then I guess just to say thank you very much. And if you have any other questions or concerns, please get hold of Jane. And um, we'd like to connect you with uh, the various other participants on this on this call. Thank you and goodbye.